Welcome to Successful Philanthropy. I'm your host, Jean Chaparoff. This show is designed to highlight the work of leaders here in the United States and then beyond. Today with us, a woman whose work is priceless. Her name, Loretta Davis. And Loretta Davis is the executive director of the retreat on the eastern end of Long Island. Let's all welcome Loretta Davis. And Loretta, for our audience, can you describe the work of the retreat and how important it is to the eastern end of Long Island? Yes, Jean, it would be my pleasure and it's great to see you again. Uh, so the retreat has been here since 1987. And what we do is provide free services that relate to domestic violence or human trafficking or any kind of relationship abuse. So we have shelters, we have attorneys, we have advocates, we have counselors, we have financial empowerment, and all the services are free. And Loretta, you yourself are an attorney. I understand you are a former prosecutor, is that correct? You know, I was a judge actually for 19 years. Uh, and um, so I was able to you know, work on those scales of justice. And, and I did work on Wall Street for a while and I've been here since 2015. So I've been part of the legal system for a number of years. And it's nice to be here at the retreat because you can actually advocate for people. When you're a judge, you know, you, you don't take one side or the other. So this is a great job. Yes, and thank you for the good work you do. Now I wanna switch a little bit to the topic of of domestic violence or abuse. I read on your website that 10 million people in the United States suffer from abuse and that only 10% of those 10 million people actually get help. Loretta, why do you think so few people go and try to get help when they're being abused? You know, Jean, it's, it's not an easy situation to be in. Uh, many survivors are members of family, of families, and they have children. There may be financial abuse or financial constraints. Sometimes people are afraid to go because the time that you leave is the most dangerous time for a survivor. That's when the violence escalates. So it's, there's shame, there's fear, there's the thought that this is going to change. I can change this situation. I can change this person. You know, sometimes they're guilt, sometimes they're trapped, they may not speak the language in this country, they don't know how to seek help, but uh, there are a lot of different reasons why people don't reach out. And often it takes seven times before, seven incidents of abuse, before someone actually leaves or calls the police. Yes, and I understand many times it's because of the fear of being attacked again by the abuser if the abuser finds out that the person is seeking help. And so it's a, it's a tough thing and it's a terrible situation. Uh, for a number of years, I served on a domestic violence um, um, group. I was involved um, on the board of the Jewish board and uh, we actually even worked with the abusers. We had a group um, each week that met and they were abusers who were being trained and um, spoken to about the abuse that they dealt out. And it's a very complicated and terrible situation. And sadly enough, what I learned was generation after generation, abuse can remain in the same family. Meaning that if a father abused his children, those children grow up and in turn will abuse their children and those they love, and then their children will abuse the next generation. And unless someone steps in and retrains people, and unless they understand what they're doing is wrong, it will continue on forever. So Loretta, the work of the retreat is so incredibly important. I wanna speak about another thing. People think that abuse is class oriented, meaning that Wealthy people, well, they just don't suffer from abuse, but that's not correct. Explain to our audience a little bit about who is the product of abuse. So I think as, as you know, Jean, anyone and everyone could be abused. I mean, it, it goes across 
all, you know, socioeconomic, class, race, uh, preference of gender, identity, it can happen to anyone. Uh, and, and it does. I mean, we see that our clients are just a mix of our community. Um, it can really, it can happen to anyone. What we try to do and what other agencies try to do is make sure that there isn't a cycle of violence. You know, people seek help with counseling, you know, that the idea is to have prevention. So a lot of what we do is our prevention education programs where we go to businesses, we go to schools, we go to communities and talk about healthy relationships. And, you know, so, and, you know, as you had mentioned before, you had worked with the perpetrators. We also had a program, they called it the Batterers Program, old fashioned name, um, but that's where individuals, perpetrators who had been convicted of misdemeanors, maybe felonies, were mandated by the court to come to this program for 32 weeks because you have to work with everyone. You have to work with the survivors, you have to work with the perpetrators to promote change because you see where we are and with the pandemic, the numbers just went up. And as you know, right now we have, we have a wait list for counseling, for our fatherhood program and for our legal services. Yes, and why do you think the numbers went up during the pandemic? I would imagine it was because people had to stay home and all of a sudden uh, they were in a maybe a, a one house or a very small house or even a very large house and uh, if people were frustrated because they could not work and maybe they were out of work and terrible, terrible time for so many different things. Yeah, I think, you know, the pandemic you know, we, there were some advantages to having the pandemic. Some good things resulted out of that. For instance, remote services, which was a way that we could reach clients. But it was really the perfect storm because a perpetrator is someone who usually uh, likes to have control and power. And, you know, suddenly maybe they lost their job and their home. And while well, they're home and their kids were home. So, you know, it was the kind of situation where they brought out you know, their frustrations on their family. And initially it was hard to reach out. People weren't aware services were still available. Um, it was hard to get the privacy. As I say, people were calling many times on the, same, on the same day because they just couldn't find that privacy to make that call. Um, but it was, it was just a situation that sort of promoted that. People were isolated and, you know, the, the cases that we got with children we didn't have the mandatory reporting from schools because they weren't there, but we received it from hospitals when the children ended up in the hospital. And, and so it was, yeah, it was, it was a tough time because people were isolated. It was hard for them to reach out, but they did. I wanna to switch to another topic and that is verbal abuse. When people think of domestic violence, they think of hitting and um, maybe pushing and, throwing, but verbal abuse is also a form of domestic violence and something that can be very damaging to a wife or to a husband and then certainly to children. And do you deal with um, the products of verbal abuse? Yes, we do. I mean, verbal abuse, emotional abuse, psychological abuse, it comes under a lot of different terms. But it's a way that a perpetrator can kind of mess with your psyche and, you know, can belittle you or say, you know, isolate you or kind of control you and make you feel that maybe this is your fault and that maybe you do deserve this. And there's a lot of manipulation that goes on and it can be in front of others, you know, you can you could go out, but you know, whenever you comment, they comment on that. And you know, it's, uh, it's very damaging. And you know, that, that causes trauma and stress and depression. And especially when you imagine it's repeated and repeated. So verbal abuse also, and as I say, financial abuse is also almost common in every single case. There's a way of preventing people from work or calling people at work too often or taking their check or not giving them a car or access to a car so that they could get to work 
or maybe physically injuring them so that they can't go to work because they don't want to show those views, uh, you know, abuses, uh, abuses, yeah. Yes, and besides verbal abuse occurring in families, it also occurs in friendships beyond just dating friendship. For example, you could be in a friendship with um, a woman you know, and that woman could be very um, insulting and, and, and not nice to you. So I always say, if you're in a friendship where a, another human being is taking stab at, stabs at you verbally, meaning they're not treating you nicely, well, you have to leave that friendship. How common is abuse in the dating scene of young teenagers? Yeah, that's something also that we deal with. And it's, it's we hear about it and, it, and it, it's common. And as you know, then they go to college and they're away and, and it's even more common. But, you know, we have the teen leadership program where we work with students that are in high school. And it's amazing what they convey to us and how they help us get the message, message out. Even, dating, you know, they don't, they don't call it dating. <laughs> they sort of call it getting together. And they talk about relationship abuse. Um, and instead of intimate partner abuse, you know, they deal with it differently, but it happens a lot. And I think that's important when you have friends who believe in you. And they always say, believe in you, you know, believe in someone when they tell you something and be supportive and don't be judgmental because you don't know what the situation is. But you know, and it may not be a good time for them to leave because often people will say, get out of that relationship now, but maybe it would be dangerous. But just to be supportive, it, it happens a lot. And teens are learning about that and asking questions about that. But they also help us with the teen leadership program on um, conveying what you say to someone, you know, so it's, it's, it's great working with youth because they have a lot of insight, but it is common. And Loretta, what about uh, sexual abuse of children and uh, then older people? Does the retreat uh, deal with these situations? And so often when a child is being abused, it goes hidden because a child is ashamed to report something like that. So how do you deal with that? Well, one of the things that we do, we have a couple, we have, of course, we have programs where we work with children as young as three, where we provide counseling to the child in person, as well as counseling to the non-abusive parent. And, you know, that's, that's really important. There's different ways that you can work with children through sand, through arts, through, through play therapy. So we, we do that, but also we go into the school systems and have different programs. One of them for the younger grades is called Hands Are Not For Hitting. So they learn, what is acceptable and what is not normal and that you can reach out to an adult that you feel you can trust and talk about that. So it's really, again, talking about what is normal and what is acceptable and what's not so that they don't feel alone and that there's someone there that they can trust. So the education component is really important because if you're brought up in a certain family where that's been the history of that family, and that's what they've seen happen in their family. They may think that's part of being a child, but it's not, and it's not acceptable. And that's what we share with the kids. Yes, and I think going into the schools and teaching children that violence and abuse is not acceptable behavior is very, very important. And what about teaching children and families about the importance of not abusing animals because animal abuse is also a terrible, terrible form of abuse. Are you involved in that as well? Yes, we are. You know, often if someone's injuring animals, they're also injuring people or if people are abusive of people, it's very likely that they're abusive of their pets. And about 15 years ago, New York law changed its law to include all pets in protective orders. So if there, you know, you were afraid of a particular perpetrator because of the conduct, you could get a protective order or a stay away order, meaning you can't go near this survivor, nor can you go near 
his cat, his horse, his dog. And if you do, you violated this order and there are going to be re repercussions. And I was a judge when that came down and I was thrilled that it did because the protective order in the past didn't. So when we have families who come to the retreat, we're able to also take their pets and we work with local agencies because you know somebody may have an allergy at the shelter, but we accept the whole family and we make sure that the animal, you know, where we can, dogs and cats and mice and hamsters are easier than horses. <laughs> but, you know, we actually take them in as well and work with local agencies that have shelters and they do that for us for free. So. Yes, for our audience, we are with Loretta Davis and she is the executive director of the retreat on the eastern end of Long Island. She is discussing abuse and the many programs that they have to combat abuse. Now, you have a shelter somewhere located on the eastern end of Long Island where you house families. And how do you protect those families from the perpetrators? So it's an anonymous location, our shelter, and it's where we have survivors come, really with the clothes on their back, and we provide them with transportation to come to our location. And we don't share the location with anyone. We've never had an abuser come to our, our shelter, which is pretty amazing. And then when they show up, they, are, they have access to counseling, advocacy, legal, case management, financial empowerment. And they're given their own room and they're given a welcome kit and if it's in the middle of the night, we have a welcome video and a number of languages so that they feel at home. And that's open to everyone. You know, most, you know, a lot of our survivors are women who are at the shelter, but it's open to all genders, all preferences, all identities. And over 60% of our residents are children because we get families. So, you know, it's, it's a way where they feel at home, they come, we have Stephanie's closet, which is full of clothes. We have the toy closet. So when they come, they're very welcome. And we've never, you know, we, it, it is an undisclosed location. And, and we've been very fortunate that, you know, we haven't had any perpetrators um, find our location. So people Thank feel you. safe. They feel very safe there. Yes, and do you have a hotline for people to call who feel that they're in trouble, they're being abused, and they fear for their lives? Yes, we do. We have a, thank you for mentioning that, Jean. We have a 24-7 hotline, and it's multiple languages, and sometimes we have two, three lines open at a time. And last year, we got about 3,600 calls on that hotline. Um, so, you know, that's a lot. Sometimes we have as many as, as 30 a day. Um, I can also give you, you know, we also have a chat. So if people can't get on the phone, there's, there's also a chat, a safe chat where they can text. But the number is 631-329-2200. And again, everything is confidential. We live in a small town, but you know, our, our clients are from all of Suffolk County, sometimes Nassau County. Um, and, but it's confidential and they're free. So we do, we get a lot of calls. We get a lot of anonymous calls and then sometimes they call us back and sometimes they don't, but at least they learn about our services. So we get about 3,600 calls a year. And 3,600 calls is quite a large number. Can you repeat that hotline number for our audience? Yes, it's 631-329-2200. Thank you very much, Loretta. Now, switching to your events, I understand you have a big fundraiser coming up in June. And I know that many people watching this show would want to either attend that event or support the retreat. And for our audience, what is the date and how do we get involved in supporting the retreat? Okay, so our event is on June 4th. It's all against abuse. And it's just about sold out. Um, it's going to be at the church in Sag Harbor. So that's, but you can always donate to the retreat if you go to allagainstabuse.org. 
If you want to donate something, you send a text to 76278, 76278, and you text all against abuse, one word, and you can learn about the retreat, you can give to the retreat. So we have this incredible event on, on June 4th, as I say, it's just about sold out, mm -hmm. but we have two other events coming up. One is the virtual gala, and the virtual gala means it's gonna be all virtual, you can watch it from home, and there's all kinds of opportunities to engage, interact, donate, and that's going to be on June 9th at 6 p.m., just about an hour. And that's all about survivors. Um, we have some great speakers that have already, you know, given incredible their comments on uh, experiencing abuse or their support of the retreat. We have Don Lemon, we have Joy Behar, we have uh, Adriana Huffington, Padma Lichmi. Uh, Monica Lewinsky talks about bullying. So, you know, that's going to be an incredible uh, experience because it really, you'll hear from survivors who inspire us. And then also on the 19th, which is Father's Day, June 19th at 1030, we are showing a movie at the Sag Harbor Cinema at 1030. So you can bring your fathers there and see this 30 minute movie about the origin of the retreat and then come to brunch up on the roof. And so it's a, it's a great new venue and it's so interesting the way the retreat started and it's, it's really an amazing moving story, so. Well, these are all exciting events and all for a great cause, the retreat. Now, Loretta, you touched upon the subject of bullying. And to all of us, we know that bullying is a terrible thing, it happens sometimes in households, it happens in high schools, it happens in many different places. How prevalent do you think bullying is despite the fact that we've all learned so much about how devastating and how destructive it is? Bullying has really changed over the years because now that we have cell phones, we have cyberbullying. So bullying continues on many levels and it stays out there. You know, um, it's something that happens in the high school, in the elementary school, in the middle school. You know, people can send photographs, they can send messages, they go on social media and you can't remove them. So that has a, a really detrimental impact on, on youth and on adults. It can be really damaging. So it's not just bullying, in the old fashioned way, it's now cyberbullying, and it and it's very prevalent and it's tough because a lot of people are very tied to social media and to their phones and to their computers. So it's hard to get away from that. So that, that is an area that um, we do a lot of work in the schools um, and work with families, but you know, that happens in work environments and uh, it's, uh, it's a challenge, it's a challenge. You know, we talk about what you do share, what you don't share, uh, you know, intimate pictures, better not to share them, those kinds of things. But yeah, it's, it can be devastating. It really can be and long lasting, not just an incident in school, you know, physically being pushed or something, you know, which is yeah, also I Imagine you train people to block bullies and also not to respond because I know that generally when someone is being bullied or threatened, the best way that I've always learned to respond is by not responding. And can you touch on that for a few minutes? Yeah, it's, it's always good, you know, not to be force with force. And it, it really depends on the situation. Sometimes it's better to say like, you know, don't do that. You know, sometimes it, it's better to let them know that you are going to speak up and um but it really depends on the situation it really does but of course you don't want to physically get into a situation unless you know obviously you're protecting yourself um but it's so it really depends on the situation but there are different things that you can do different people you can talk to again that's about trusting and it should be acceptable and you know talking to someone who can help with that making sure that they do either in the work environment in the school environment or you know, if it's abuse at home, that you, you, know, you talk to a counselor and you try to get that changed, so. 
And what about stalkers? How do you deal with stalkers? Because many of us have had stalkers and a stalker can be a very serious thing and very dangerous. And for those people who can't immediately go to say authorities because of fear of a retaliation by a stalker or for other reasons, what do you suggest? Yeah, you know, we, we do help um, individuals with uh, stalking situations. Um, the law is not easy in that respect, but um, because it requires so much. So it's always good to document. It's good to have pictures. It's good to keep a journal. You know, if you see someone who's driving by your home, who's driving by where you work, who's parking the car, it's always good to have pictures of that. Um, and to document what's going on. And, and there's, it has to be, you know, there's gotta be a pattern. So, you know, the law is pretty stringent, but there are laws to help prevent that. And, and you know, to get a protective order. And that's, that's, what you, that's a good way to start. Yes, and to also document, keep all emails and all texts from a stalker. And yes. this way you have a paper trail and never, never erase them. Also never respond because that only edges and, and, and keeps a stalker interested in stalking. And stalking also happens through Instagram and Facebook and then um, other modalities. So for the audience, just be careful, keep a paper record and then try to seek help. Now we have just a few minutes left and we really have a wonderful guest today, Loretta Davis, executive director of the retreat. And we have discussed various forms of abuse, be it a verbal abuse, domestic abuse, and other types of abuse such as bullying. And for those who are watching this show, who might be the subject of some sort of abuse, what should they do? You know, you can, if you can always call a, a local agency that has expertise. You could call the retreat at 631-329-2200. Um, as I say, it's best to um, have a safety plan in, in place, meaning if something happens, there's someone that you call, you have your important documents in, in a particular place. So if you have to leave, you can leave quickly and really just try to seek help and have somebody that you can trust. Sometimes it takes a while to uh, leave a situation um, and you need that confidence. And it's good to seek counseling. You know, you can see if there's some sort of legal action that you wanna take in terms of moving, in terms of stay away orders, protective orders, or divorce, you know, all of those are up to you as the, as the individual, but tell somebody that you can trust and try to get help really from an agency. Cause sometimes what your friends say to you may not be the right thing, you know, but they don't deal with the situation all along. And if you're someone, if you're a standby or, or you're a friend of someone, just believe them and support them and don't judge them. Yes, so you're suggesting to seek professional help if you are the subject of uh, domestic abuse or other types of abuse. And I think that's very smart. And it's so nice and so important to know that the retreat is there for those who live on the Eastern end of Long Island, Nassau and Suffolk County. Loretta, you've been a wonderful, wonderful guest. I wanna thank you personally for the great work you do. This concludes Successful Philanthropy. Our guest today, Loretta Davis, she is Executive Director of The Retreat. I'm Jean Schafferoff, your host. I'll see you next week.